see you all. I want to give a warm welcome also to all those who may be watching at home this morning. Um, just want to introduce a little moment of reflection here today. What do we imagine we receive when we come to church as we so often see, even though I like to avoid the phrase coming to church since we are the church as the people of God. But why do we come to our Sunday morning gatherings? Is church more like a hospital because we realize that we are not okay? Many things within us are still broken and we need help, just like we seek help from a physician. Is church more like a meal where you come as a hungry people and you really feel like uh, at least our spirits are being nourished, uh, just like we need our daily meals at home? Is church like a party? <laughs> Where many go to see their friends and uh, people they like to hang out with and to actually be in a more celebratory mood. Uh, certainly things that would point towards that as we sing hymns of praise and thanksgiving. Or is church more like a school where we come mainly to be taught things that we may have forgotten or things that we have never learned before, things that equip us for the road ahead or is church like a gym or an exercise class where our spiritual muscles are trained for the battle ahead? I think the answer to these questions is all of the above and probably a whole lot more. And so we're greatly privileged uh, to be able to come together again here this morning. Uh, we will sing later a hymn about faithfulness and it's one of the things that I treasure the most that we can always count on God to be faithful so many ways, bringing out the sun again after the rain, looking after all our needs, and also uh, making sure that we reach the glorious goal that he has for all of us. Uh, I just want to point out a couple announcements you may already have seen, uh, the ones uh, mentioned on the PowerPoint. Uh, our church council has decided that uh, if you're wearing a mask, it's okay to sing softly behind your mask. <laughs> so that's one thing that we have decided that would still be safe to do. Also, um, I wanted to remind you about the family camp uh, that Pastor Calvin is offering. If you have any questions about that, it's towards the end of July, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, this mostly like camping style. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yep. if, if there is anyone here this morning that's interested, you can talk to Pastor Calvin afterwards. And um, yeah. I also want to say a big thank you to all those uh, who are helping to make these services possible. Our greeters, our ushers, our cleaners, uh, Harvey so faithfully playing for us, and the worship team later on in our second service. I uh, also want to thank all the council members that have put in a lot of time to discuss what is safe, uh, what do we need to arrange. Uh, thank you so much for all the time they put in uh, last Monday. <laughs> as they stay very late here. So continue to pray for them as well. But now I want to ask uh, Simon, who is the chairperson for the church council, uh, to pass on a couple things from the council as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, just wanted to give you guys a really quick update um, about some council things coming up. Uh, so first of all, we're going to do the council installation where we all come up to the front and you guys all pray for us. That'll be happening at the end of August. Um, so it would be great if you guys could all come out. Uh, we'll be at both the uh, first service and the second. So uh, whichever one you come to, you'll see us there. Um, as well, we're setting up uh, the usual EFC AGM. Usually we have one in the spring and the fall. So the next one coming up, we'll go and uh, we'll do the fall AGM, so you'll hear an update from us and where the new council is at and all of the, the things that have been happening this last year at that point. And as PJ said, we've had lots of volunteers and things um, helping with startup, so um, we'll be looking for some people as well. So if you feel uh, led to go and volunteer and help us keep church up and running, that would be great. So just speak with me. And as always, um, if you feel need to go and volunteer for any of the committees and just have an itch to do something specific here in church, please 
uh, let somebody from the council know and we'll go and figure out somewhere good to put you. So, yeah, uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Simon. And now let's sing the hymn I mentioned, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your faithfulness in our lives. You've brought us yet again through another week. You carry us with your loving arms, often through difficult situations where we don't feel up to the challenge, but it is you who's always there beside us and within us and watching over us. Thank you, Lord, for the guidance in our lives. Thank you for providing for our physical needs. Thank you that we can trust you even in the threat of still a virus crisis, that we can always count on you to look out for us and also to help us to make good choices. Thank you, Lord, for the spiritual feeding that we continue to receive from your word, and I pray particularly for that part here this morning, that you would empower Pastor Kelvin as he brings your word. Continue to teach us, Lord, what it means to follow Jesus. 
also what it means to rest and to receive. Lord, so often we hurry through our lives and we hardly take the time to really um, come to a place of rest and listening. So give us that inner ability to listen as true disciples listen, with a willingness also then to follow and to put into practice the things that we learn. Pray, Father, that your spirit now would open up our hearts and make us receptive and that we would also learn to learn to love each other better. Thank you now for this time of the service and bless particularly those who are still going through a time of illness or loneliness. Bless those who are listening at home. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture reading this morning, I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 to 24, and I'll be using the New Living Translation. There Paul writes, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work, and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. We'll sing another hymn, Take My Life, and let it be before Pastor Calvin then comes and brings the word this morning. Take my life. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be up here this morning bringing you the Lord's Word. 
And uh, yeah, we look forward to what we are going to uncover as we spend time uh, in Philippians. So I just want to catch up for a second. Last week, uh, Pastor Jesse finished the message talking about Jesus and his perfect example of humility. We read, we can read it and we can understand it, but how do we go about practicing it? How could any of us ever hope to achieve a fraction of what Jesus achieved in his life? It's tough to live up to that. Mark Twain has a famous quote where he says, few things are harder to put into practice than the annoyance of a good example. Perhaps the most annoying thing about a good example is our inability to follow it. Admiration and, uh, can inspire us, but it doesn't enable us to follow. For that, we need to focus. We need to work at being that good example. It takes a lot of effort to do. Today, we're going to be talking about how we're given the power inside of us so that the light, God's light, can shine through and be made visible to others. Some may say uh, that it, some may say or believe that it is normal for everyday Christian life to look similar to a roller coaster, the ups and downs. Now, I personally don't like roller coasters, and I don't go on them because they make me feel sick. But it doesn't negate the example that we can have. There's ups and downs in our life. And the normal Christian life is God working in us so that God can work through us. God works in us, and we work it out. Turn with me, or you can look above uh, at Philippians 2, uh, and we're going to start at verse 12, and I'll read verse 13 as well. It says this, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. I want to stop there for a minute and kind of look at these verses and what they're saying. Verse 12 can be radically misinterpreted. So, to make sure that we understand what these verses are saying, we're going to unpack them. The phrase, work hard to show your results of your salvation. This does not suggest that we have to work for our salvation. Remember, Paul is writing to the believers and the Christ followers. These people were already in the family. He's writing to those who, have, who were already saved and who called uh, on their beloved, Jesus. These people were told, not told to work hard for the salvation, but to put it into practice. To put into practice salvation so that they could honor what they had already received. Working hard is a phrase. It's similar to the use of working in a field or in a garden like many of us are doing. It's hard to till the ground. It's hard to pick the weeds and to do that work. But doing the hard work and staying focused, trust, trusting the rain will come and the harvest will grow. Salvation in the New Testament can have a variety of meanings. And I just want to go over a few of them. Philippians 1.9, we've already looked at in the past, says, For I know that you pray for me in my spirit. Uh, Jesus Christ helps me and will lead me to my deliverance. Deliverance here is also the Greek word for salvation. And Paul was talking about his freedom from prison. In Philippians 1.28, it says, Don't be intimidated uh, in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that you are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. Again, here, Paul is talking about salvation from our bodies and from the presence of sin. And thirdly, today in our passage, Philippians 2.12, Dear friends, you, are always, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep, deep reverence and fear. Paul is talking about the squabbles 
that are beginning to arise within the church in Philippian, uh, Philippi. Sorry. And it's hard for them to discuss the problems that are going on. They're trying to figure it out, trying to figure out all the angles and solutions that may be actually there. But until you actually go and do the work, until you actually go and do the work and see for yourself how things will actually work out, you can discuss it forever. Paul is telling them, get active, get out there, don't just sit there. Discussions are good, but it's better to be active. In taking action, we need to remember that it needs to be done with a deep reverence and fear. This is the outward showing of our salvation, and it is to be done in complete trust in God and not ourselves. The only way this can be realized is through God and not finding that answer within ourselves. In verse 13, it goes on, for this uh, part of um, the phrase, for God who also works in you. God is alive and working in you. And the first part of this, God is working in you, is to be a question. What is he working in you? How is he working in you? God is working not only in you, for you, but for him as well. God has loved us, and he loves us so much that he laid his son's life down. Jesus did that for us, so that we could follow him in his example. We're not only joining in the work of God, but we desire to do the work of God as well. The next question we have to ask is, how does God work in me? Well, to answer that, I have an example up here. We all have toolboxes at home, and we have tools in those, because we need multiple tools to do our tasks. For example, for example, most kids, if you ask them what tool they need, this is what they need. They need a hammer. Hammers fix everything. Well, so they believe. I remember when I was a camp counselor, we had the opportunity to destroy a girl's bathroom. Now, as a boy, that was the best thing ever. And so the first tool I grabbed was a 20-pound sledgehammer because nothing brings walls down better than a hammer. But then we had all the cleanup afterwards. That wasn't so much fun. But we need tools to fix our problems. How many of us would just carry around a hammer thinking that would fix all of our problems? But it doesn't. We need a toolbox. And in this toolbox, there's many different tools. And the purpose of a toolbox is to carry those tools that we might need. Now, a wonderful invention was made a few years ago called the multi-tool. And I love carrying this around with me because it has a variety of uses. It's got a knife, it's pliers, it's got screwdrivers, it's got everything I might need for an emergency fix. But it still doesn't replace the toolbox and everything that is in that. We need to fix some problems. What are some tools that you can think of that are in God's toolbox? Each believer is in his toolbox. We are God's tools. Each one of us has different gifts he's given us. And he works through us. Or he uses us to reach and to minister to others. How does God work in me? Well, I think that he uses his tools like the Bible, prayer. Even our struggles are some of his tools. We may be part of it, but how it's written is not always in the toolbox. We are also being worked on. God uses three things that I mentioned before in our life to work on us. The first is the Bible. We see in the passage here in verse 16, and we'll get there soon, but it says that Paul, um, Paul says in everything we are to hold fast to the word of life. He says that we don't stand on our own accomplishments and selfish desires. We stand firm. We hold fast to the Bible, which is the word of life. 
The second tool that he uses is our prayer life. There are hundreds of verses in scripture that talk about the importance of prayer. It's how we communicate with God. And God uses those for us to get to know him. How do we know God? We know God through his word and through prayer. Last summer we went to Winnipeg to visit family and friends. And while we were there, we went to our previous church just to visit. And during the service, they did something that I had never seen done in a service before. And it was rather unique. They took time during their message and they quieted down and asked everyone to pray. Now, that's not unusual. Churches pray all the time. But this prayer was one that lasted 30 minutes of us sitting there silently praying, exploring the scriptures, listening to God. After the time was up, they asked us to share what we had heard from God. And it was a powerful time. Do we take time out of our week like that to pray, to intentionally set aside time as a body? Now, I know that we do pray together, and that's good. But what would it look like if we spent time praying like that? Listening to God as a body. Taking time with no distractions around us to hear from God and to publicly share what we have heard and let that be affirmed with the other believers. We take time out of our day at home to pray. But we all have things to do. We're busy. But it really brings a new light to me, uh, Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians, where it says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of Christ, or for the will of God for you in Jesus Christ. The final tool that God uses uh, is suffering. Suffering or struggles, we all have them. We all face them. We all go through times of trouble. Things go crazy in our life and we don't know how to handle them. We need to rely and go to prayer uh, for God, or to ask God how to get through some of these. It's tough because we see our inability to hold it together on our own. And we will cry out to God, help us. That's why the old adage that says the most dangerous thing in our spiritual lives is comfort and safety. It's true. God uses these three tools to work out his pleasure in our lives. It is important for us to understand that when we allow God to work in our lives, it's not always going to turn out the way we think it should. He's not working in our lives for our pleasure, but for his, and to see his will be done. God is seeking people who are willing to lay down their lives and be a light in this world. We have just seen the tools that God uses and how he works in our lives. But now let's look at how we work that out and how that can become different. Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like the bright lights of the world, full of crooked people and perverse people. Here's a little bit of interaction. What is this? A light bulb, I'm hearing some of you say it. That's right, we can interact, that's fine. What does it need to work? Power, that's right. So th right now, this is a light bulb. It isn't going to work because I don't have power up here for it. There's one other thing that it needs to fulfill its purpose. 
I'll first go with the power, which you guys mentioned. That's good. If a light bulb doesn't have power, it's no good. I could put this in a dark room, and it wouldn't do anything. It would still be a light bulb, but it would just sit there. It isn't fulfilling its purpose. But the second thing that it needs, that, and this is more important, is it needs darkness. It needs darkness. Because how useful would this light bulb be if I was to plug it in and just hold it there? Not turn it on. It wouldn't be useful at all. Now, if I plug it in and turn it on in here, how useful would it be? It would give a little bit of light, but we have light coming in from all around us. It's insignificant, the light that it would cast, compared to the light that's coming in from the windows. I could turn off all the other lights and it wouldn't really make a difference. We have them on just in case it does get darker, but it wouldn't make that much of a difference. If I was to go outside and turn on this light, that would be silly. No one would notice it. There needs to be a contrast. There needs to be darkness. That is when this light will fulfill its purpose the best, is when there is that contrast. As Christians, what we do here at church is important. But what we do out with our families and our friends is equally important. People can be crooked, meaning they can do what they want, get what they want, and they will oftentimes think to themselves, I'm doing this for my own happiness. You don't need to turn far to see this. We can see this in the news. We can see this within our own families. They're twisted, and they see what they want, and they don't oftentimes care who they hurt to get it. We see this in the news all the time, stories of rape, murder, death, gossip, lies, and scandals. This is people reaching out and getting what they want, not caring what happens. But God calls us to stand as a light in our areas of influence and let others see God's salvation and what He is doing in our lives. God's will is being done. When we are surrounded by light, we are choosing not to be selfish. We are choosing not to do things without grumbling or disputing. We're choosing to live selfless lives and lay down what we want for what God wants. We begin to stand out as God's light. And you know what happens when we stand out? Others are encouraged. Others are attracted to that light. And we have the opportunity to share with them the hope and the joy of Jesus Christ and what he is doing in our lives. This is what I know to be true. The Christian life is about God working in you and you following him. And the beautiful thing is that it always ends the same way, with us being filled with joy. When, our life, when we live our life, uh, it's not about us, but it's about Jesus and his love and justice. Then we are filled with joy in the midst of suffering. And Paul shows this example through his own life. Verses 16 to 18, it says, Hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that that work was not useless. I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out as a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful servants, service is offering to God. And I want all of you to share in that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. So how do we end this? 
How many of you have fear of what, uh, how many of you have the fear of what you have done in your life will not make a difference? I'll be honest, I sometimes have that fear. That everything that I'm doing is for naught. When I start to think about my family, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to be active in their faith. I want them to love Jesus and not resent him. When it comes to ministry, I try to think of how I could be the best at something. Or how I could be that example that everyone wants to follow. I want to stand out. I want to be different. I want to be someone who points their, their life to Jesus. And that others can see that. My thoughts will go there. But I have to admit, I'm not right in that thinking. As I'm wasting my life thinking about those things. Because I'm pursuing fame. And things that don't satisfy. We pursue money. And it doesn't satisfy. Because when it comes right down to it, you will never be famous enough. You will never be rich enough to satisfy the desires of your heart. There's lots of examples of the wealthiest people searching after that, and the most famous people searching after that, and the greatest people who desperately seek something more. And when they get what they want, when they get that desire, they're never satisfied. They still feel empty, and they continue searching after it. Do not live a life where you are desperately trying to seek that satisfaction. In these things there is no joy. You might be happier for a second or for a week, but never eternally. The joy that Paul is speaking of when you let, out, when you let God work in and through you is a life of satisfaction, a life that is filled with joy. Our time on this earth will end. When you come back, uh, will you look back and wish that you had more money or fame? I hope not. I hope that you will look back and wish that your life had meant something. Here's your chance. Allow God to work in you and you will begin to desire the things that He desires. You will start to see that satisfaction in your life and you will feel that joy that God has given you. Ask yourself, are you allowing God to work in your life? This week I want you to try opening up your Bible and try praying to Him like you've never had before. Taking extra time to pray and seek Him. Listen to Him. What is he saying to you? And let him transform your life. He makes lives seeking purpose and purpose filled. Allow God to work in you and you will be that generation of light. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the words that Paul is challenging us with. To not just be satisfied with what we have here, but to do something else. To seek you in everything that we do. To boldly go with the things that are troubling us and know that you are working through them. And Lord, as we look at your word, as we look at time spent with you, may we be able to spend that and see that as valuable. Lord, speak to us. Show us your desires and where you would have us step out. Where you would have us reach out in your name. And let us not be scared. Let us not be afraid. But let us go with that boldly, knowing that you are leading and guiding each one of us. So Lord, we thank you that we are part of your family. We thank you that we have these promises and assurances. And Lord, may we come back together being able to testify of your goodness and how you are working 
and how you have stretched us. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite Pastor Josh back up here to um, lead us in our final hymn. Thank you, Pastor Calvin. Let's sing together channels of